Hello, good morning, and welcome to the QCAM webinar today. My name is Peter McLaughlin. I am a staff scientist here at QCAM in the Pleasanton office, and it's my pleasure to introduce Prof Professor Martin Head Gordon. He is the Kenneth S. Pitzer Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at the University of California at Berkeley and the Scientific Advisor to QCAM Incorporated. Dr. Head Gordon's research group centers on the development of new electronic structure theory methods and their implementation as efficient computer algorithms. He is recognized with many awards, such as the Medal of International Academy of Quantum Molecular Sciences and his election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Chemical Society Fellow, and most recently, the Schrodinger Medal of Watak. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome Professor Martin Head Gordon on his talk today. All right, thank you, Peter. So all right, well, um, um, it's a pleasure to give this webinar. Um, for those of you who are not fans of ancient history, um, I'm a co-founder of QCAM back in the um, Paleolithic era of circa 1993. Um, QCAM really began at the end of 1992 with my um, longtime friend and colleague, Peter Gill, and, um, and Benny Johnson beginning to write a, a brand new code that split away from uh, from Gaussian, and um, well, here we are now, and it's my pleasure to then tell you something about um, a topic that interests me a lot. Um, I'm not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a part-time hobby for me, which is some um, um, localized orbitals and what can they uh, tell us about what electrons are doing in molecules uh, in organometallic complexes, and in particular, um, in, in particular connection to the oxidation state problem. Um, so, um, before I go anywhere, I need to acknowledge my collaborators, and um, this work would not have been possible without three key people. Um, so, my student Abdul al um has coded um, and co-designed the Oslo procedure that I'll be telling you about. He's also implemented uh, new code for IAOs and um, building, building off QCAM's AutoSAD capability that underlies the population analysis in Oslo. Um, Marty Gimfra is a student who, um, uh, of, of Pedro Salvador's, and Marty came to visit um, my group at Berkeley, and I want to um, thank him for taking the initiative and Pedro for granting him the permission to do this. He arrived um, not too long before the pandemic began, and so, um, and so quite a bit of his visit was, uh, was then virtual. But um, it's been great fun interacting with Marty, who um, does co-designed the Clarity Index uh, and produced the new LOBA results, co-designed Oslo, um, did, um, did the calculations and much of the interpretation for the data I'll tell you about. And um, I've already acknowledged Pedro, but he's, he's been also a key player in this. So thank you very much to them. Thank you to you for spending some of your time listening to this. Um, and now let's, uh, let's, uh, let me add another thank you to the QCAM team. Um, here's a relatively recent picture. You know, I owe them a, a great debt of gratitude. And I think the entire QCAM community does for kind of maintaining our code, developing the in-house features that are not necessarily suitable graduate student projects. And um, uh, there is one figure missing there. That's Quan Yu, who actually took the picture. Um, from left to right, we've got Yu Zhang, um, Xintian Feng, um, our host today, uh, Peter McLaughlin, um, the director of operations, Evgeny Ipanovsky. Um, Shannon Houck and Eric Berquist, and then I'm the ringer there, um, trying to uh, trying to join in briefly. Um, and one other piece of exciting news is that the QCAM5 paper is just published. So this is the sort of archival um, paper that is a well a, a great um, monster to produce, and uh, the QCAM. Um, cooperation tries to, we try to make these papers about once every five or six years and um, really it, this this one was driven by um, uh, Anna Krilov and John Herbert with some help from me as well and uh, you can download it from JKM Fizz um, and read a lot about all the features I'm not telling you about today. Um, all right, so with that, uh, with those preliminaries out of the way, let's begin with a bit of introduction to the topic of the day, which is about trying to find oxidation states. And this slightly whimsical cartoon down the bottom here was produced um, by my, by my um, joint postdoc with Alex Bell, uh, Jeroen van der Meinsberger. 
and um, and sort of exemplifies the issue. We would like to um, have methods that can actually predict the oxidation state because the oxidation state is one of those concepts in chemistry that the trickier the system becomes, the more relevant it often is. So, um, so to begin with a bit of basic background, um, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry says that the oxidation state of an atom is the charge of this atom after ionic approximation of its heteronuclear bonds. So if the atom in question is a metal atom, then typically there will, um, in an organometallic complex, there will be bonds to ligands, and, um, and then based on electronegativity, um, one will partition the electron pairs written down in a Lewis structure, giving the atoms, giving the each pair of electrons to the more electronegative atom. Um, and, um, and these algorithms, um, the IUPAC ionic model, um, works quite well in practice, especially when electronegativity differences are large and the bonding is predominantly ionic. Um, but IUPAC themselves recognizes that there are, in quotes, limits beyond which the oxidation state ceases to be well-defined or becomes ambiguous and to kind of float a few of the concepts um, that uh, are associated with uh, this interesting limit. They include redox non-innocence, metallic bonds, well, the covalent limit. Um, and today's talk, um, apart from some warm-up exercises, will largely be trying to work in those limits. And if you want to look and see what IUPAC has to say, um, then, um, uh, then you can find out in this paper. Um, and uh, all right, and um, and then just to kind of maybe reinforce the fact that um, uh, the, the ligand non-innocence is an important issue, um, electrocatalysis is one of the main chemical applications that my group has been working on in recent years. And um, the picture here in the middle of the screen is a, um, a quaterpyridine complex that um, Matthias Leupersberger um, worked to, this is one of the most efficient CO2 to CO reduction catalysts um, with in, intriguingly different characteristics for cobalt as the metal versus iron as the metal. And, um, and of course, there are two reductions as well as two protonation steps. And the role of the metal versus the ligand in the reduction steps is of course lies at the lies at the heart of you know oxidation states and so um here is a picture of an orbital from one of the reduced species involving the iron catalyst and you can see the orbital spreads over the entire complex and um and the population on the metal is something like 10 percent in the cobalt case the corresponding re reduction is more heavily metal centered but you can see these are going to be the kinds of tricky issues and looking at canonical orbitals that spread over the entire molecule may not be the best way to do it. So, um, so that will be one of our objectives is to try and seek out alternatives. Um, and, um, and if you were just sort of beginning to run your favorite quantum chemistry package, which we always hope is QCHEM, um, and we're trying to think about oxidation states, you might think about simply beginning with, um, um, with atomic charges. And, um, and you might hesitate for a moment because after all, atomic charges are not observables, but then again, neither are oxidation states necessarily. There are indirect observables associated with oxidation states like characteristics of core spectroscopy. Um, but when you actually go looking at it, um, well, this is a, a whole collection of complexes um, organized according to D3, D5, D4, D6, D5, D8, D10, a variety of oxidation states, two first, featuring charges of, well, one, or charges of none, um, or charges of 0.6. Then um, jumping from manganese two to manganese three, instead of the charge on manganese going up, the charge may go down, or it may go up by a little bit, or it may change just again by a fraction. So you can see that um, looking at atomic charges is probably not too helpful. So, um, so one might then dig into um, an alternative population analysis, which is the uh, atomic spin densities. And these are undoubtedly more useful, quite a lot more useful than total charges, but would still be ambiguous. And they would be ambiguous in particular in cases where there is no net spin density. In other words, then, it, then, then the measure is kind of blind um, about how the electrons are partitioned. 
but if there is net spin density, you can see here the D3 vanadium complex really does have three unpaired electrons on vanadium, on, and then with water in the high spin state, you see the same thing. Cyanide as the ligand, CO as the ligand, all looks pretty good. But, and then jumping from D3 to D5, you can now see things that begin to make sense back to D4, um, but it's, it's not always helpful. In other words, here's iron three with 4.27 electrons or um, um, so, and, and then finally the most telling cases, are the ones where there's no net spin density. If one goes looking at high oxidation states of manganese, um, so in other words, as high as D0, um, um, then down to D1, D2, D3, you can see that, um, that the, the jump is quite good between D0 and D1 in terms of the spin density, and from D1 to D2, and then from D2 to D3, a little trickier. Um, so, uh, so overall, we can perhaps conclude that more specialized tools than standard population measures of population are needed to probe oxidation states. And that's uh, the motivation for the work that I'll tell you about now. So, um, so we're now on to the first main topic, which is um, um, how to, um, a, a bit about how to think about and what are two useful oxidation state analysis tools in, contained in QCAM. Um, well, the first is some called localized bonding analysis, localized orbital bonding analysis, or LOBA for short. And um, this is actually a, a semi-vintage method now. Um, it was developed by Alex Tom in my group with Eric Sundstrom, uh, then a beginning graduate student, back in 2008-9. Um, and we've recently resurrected it and improved it, as I'll tell you about shortly. But let me give you an overview of the vintage version first. One typically gets the canonical occupied orbitals to begin with, and so for a long chain um, polyene like like this one, uh, actually you, you get orbitals that actually look you know spread out over the entire molecule. The first step in LOBA is to transform from canonical orbitals to localized orbitals, so we can begin to zero in on what's going on in a bond. Um, so the bigger the molecule the more dramatic the difference between the canonical occupieds and the localized occupieds, so hence this example. Um, and then the next step is to do population analysis on the localized orbitals. So instead of trying to look at net atomic populations, we're going to, we're going to look at the electron pairs one at a time in the localized orbital representation. And we will declare that an orbital is localized on an atom, i.e suitable for an ionic distribution of charge if its population exceeds a threshold. Um, and then correspondingly, there's also a window below that threshold where an electron pair should be allocated or divided covalently. And so this, um, this LOBA procedure really is a computational quantum chemistry mimic of the IUPAC procedure. We're going to make an ionic division for each electron pair one at a time. And there's the generalization that if we don't meet the threshold, we'll then be forced to do a covalent division of charge. And then finally, um, you form the metal oxidation state as the atomic number minus the number of electrons that have been declared to be localized on that atom. Okay, so um, is this a concept that's viable? I should show you some data. And really the question here is, is there a threshold that reproduces accepted oxidation states. So this is this graph is showing you a collection of 32 transition metal complexes with accepted oxidation states. So these are not pushing the limits of the IUPAC definition. Um, and on the y-axis is um, is the error in the oxidation state. So ideally we'd like to be at zero, but if we've got some points that are away from zero, we'll either be having a metal atom that's too oxidized or too reduced. And on the x-axis is the threshold we choose. So um, if we choose threshold, you know, maybe this plot is easiest to read from right to left. So if we pick a very, very tight threshold of nearly one to declare that both electrons belong to um, the atom whose threshold we're looking at, whose population we're looking at, we'll get oxidation states much too positive, errors up to plus six. But as we begin winding the threshold down, maybe to about 0.75 or a little bit 
um, thereabouts, even a little bit more, then the number of errors go to zero. And of course, if we were to begin from the left of the graph um, and have a very soft threshold for allocating a pair of electrons to an atom, we'll make an error in the oxidation state that is in favor of, be, of, the, of the metal atom being overly reduced. The oxidation state will be too negative. And, um, and then happily, there's a giant white space in the middle that would say that there's a big range of thresholds within which all the oxidation states in this calibration set are correctly reproduced. So anywhere between about 0.4 and 0.8. Um, so we, we pick something like 0.6 um, as, uh, as a reasonable threshold, and then LOBA is ready to run. Um, since the theme of, to of today's talk is about oxidation states that are at the borderline of the applicability of the IUPAC definition, where you might really want to look at the orbitals, um, um, you might actually get cases, and we'll see later on that we do get cases, that lie um, very close to the boundary of, uh, to that threshold boundary. And so working with Marti we, and Pedro, we introduced what we call a clarity index to try, and, uh, to try and measure how confident we should be about the borderline cases. And so the variable X here is just recasting the, popula the, the population in dimensionless units, the difference between the metal M and the rest of the system X for a given bond um, is, is the variable X. And we will be making the ionic assignment for x greater than some threshold p, um, and the covalent assignment, in other words, getting half the charge for x less than p. So this is a kind of step function like this, going from a half to one in terms of assigning the electrons is, um, is the situation that we're confronted with. And so if we're in the regime where x is approaching one, there's no ambiguity. If x is approaching zero, there's no ambiguity. But if x is in the neighborhood of this switching parameter p, which should be 0.2 to match the previous threshold 0.6, um, then, um, then we're in the ambiguous regime. And, um, and well, there's no single unique way to define a clarity index, but there are many reasonable possibilities. And having a reasonable possibility is much better than having nothing at all. So we introduce a transition width 0.1. So in other words, um, about half of the way back to the perfectly covalent limit and a little bit beyond the boundary for switching to ionic. And our clarity index for a covalent assignment goes to 100 if we're um, if we're a, a popular if we're W away from the the switch point P, and our ionic assignment likewise goes to 100 percent 100 a clarity index of 100 if we're more than W above. And in detail, that's the formula to do it. But formulas are tricky, and it's better to actually see it work in an example. So um, let me present one example uh, to show LOBA in action. And this is some, um, this is the, this is actually, well, it's a, it's a non-metal, but it's a useful non-metal to begin with, because it illustrates the um, crossover between the ionic and the covalent regi regimes just within a molecule that's hopefully easy enough that you can think about it on the fly. So if you wish, scribble down the Lua structure for ONCH33. So in other words, this is a four coordinate nitrogen, um, not three, not normal three coordinate. If you were to write down the formal charges, it would be, that is to say the covalent um, division uh, of the bonds, um, then you'd have O minus N plus and methyl zeros. If you were to apply IUPAC's ionic model, well, that would not quite be appropriate in this case. It would suggest oxygen is minus two, nitrogen is minus one, and the methyls are plus one. Well, how do I know it's not appropriate? Um, actually, I feel like I don't know anything in this kind of um, area until I look at the orbitals. Um, so um, so let's, um, let's begin looking at some orbitals. So these are the localized orbitals that we get from um, as the input to LOBA. Um, so these are PIPEC MISE localized occupied orbitals. And I'm showing you the, the um, CN and the NO um, sigma bond orbitals. And here are the, um, the Lovedean populations on the two sites. So the nitrogen is slightly more electronegative, gets a population of one, the carbon slightly less, population of 0.8. A little bit of the two electrons goes elsewhere. 
but this lies in the regime where the clarity index for this to be a covalent bond is 100. We are quite confident, and you can see it, you get more confident after you look at it, that that looks like a covalent bond. And the bonding between nitrogen and oxygen also looks covalent. Here are the, um, here are the charges on the two atoms, and the clarity index comes out as 100 as well. So, um, so far, um, LOBA will then be forced to make covalent subdivisions of this sigma bonding framework. And, um, and then there are some orbitals that do localize rather well. Um, these are orbitals that look basically like lone pairs on oxygen. They look p-type. Um, and um, the population on oxygen is not exactly two, but it's pretty, pretty darn close, 1.8 roughly. And so the, the clarity index saying that this is an ionic distribution is 100. We are perfectly sure of it. And I trust you will agree as you stare at those well-localized lone pairs. So, um, so this is a, a relatively simple case. It's a case um, that lies outside the formal applicability of the IUPAC ionic model. And it shows you that LOBA um, can distinguish nicely between electron pairs that are ionic and electron pairs that are covalent. And so it in fact recapitulates the correct formal charges that we should have expected from writing down the Lewis structure. So, uh, so that's kind of a, a warm up for LOBA. Um, well, that's the first of the um, oxidation state specific tools that QCAM has to offer. I should now tell you about something brand new, which is oxidation states from localized orbitals, which um, turns into the uh, into the Oslo acronym. And so this is developed with Abdul and Marti and Pedro. The code implementation in QCAM is Abdul's. Um, and let me tell you a bit about the algorithm. Um, the algorithm is to first make some orbitals that are um, optimally localized to a fragment, not just optimally localized period, but optimally localized to a fragment. And so to do this, um, we minimize the second moment around the fragment center of charge. So for instance, if I'm doing iron porphyrin, um, then um, and, and I'm looking at the iron, I will just put the center of the center of charge of the iron at the origin, the center of porphyrin. And then I'll make this matrix of the second moments um, of, of, um, of, of the orbitals. Um, and, um, and I seek to minimize the second moments. How do I minimize the second moments? Well, I, in fact, I just diagonalize that matrix. The smallest eigenvalues will be the core orbitals, say, of iron and iron porphyrin. Larger ones will then become ions valence orbitals, and yet larger ones could belong to the other fragments. Um, and so that's the, the general idea, the general concept. Um, in practice, though, the most diffuse valence orbitals of iron in iron porphyrin may overlap the, um, uh, the ligand orbitals. And by the way, what's the, orig what's the optimal origin for the ligand center in iron porphyrin? Well, it's also the same origin because that's a macrocyclic ligand that, the, you know, that envelops the iron atom. So we also need um, uh, a cross-check. And the cross-check um, that was proposed by, um, by Marti and Pedro is this fragment orbital localization index, or Foley. And um, the math is down below. Um, this is built off of um, um, off of the off of PIPEX de uh, delocalization measure NA, uh, which goes to one for um, um, uh, well, essentially this Foley index is designed such that if you have um, a, a fragment orbital that really does live entirely on the fragment, that index becomes one. First, you build d sub i for the ith orbital. If that orbital is um, entirely localized to a given atom, then one of these populations will be one, the others will be zero. You'll get an index of one here. And then you take this and divide by the population on that atom. So again, perfectly lo localized um, orbitals will yield a Foley value of one. If on the other hand, you go to the covalent limit, the two center covalent limit of having um, half the population on each of two fragments, then the Foley index will turn into two. And so the transition from one perfect localization towards two perfect delocalization 
will be quite instructive and, um, and in fact is, uh, is what we will use to design an iterative algorithm that basically selects the most localized orbitals with the smallest Foley values, removes them from the list of orbitals to categorize and repeats. Um, if that's not entirely obvious, um, it may be easier to again look at an example. And we measure the populations using a, a, uh, a molecule adapted minimal basis and IAO basis. So to see um, Oslo in action, let's consider ferrocene. So here we have uh, three fragments, the iron atom in the middle with the origin, uh, with its center at the origin, and cyclopentadienyl anions, well, hopefully anions, let's find out, um, uh, cyclopentadienyl ligands at any rate above and below um, uh, along the symmetrically offset in terms of centers along the Z axis. If we focus on the cyclopentadienyl ligand um, um, at negative Z, um, what one pulls out from these fragment localized orbitals are, um, are orbitals that no longer localize individually in bonds, because remember what we're doing is maximizing fragment localization. So we get five linearly independent combinations of CH bonds that all belong to, um, to the, um, uh, to the cyclopentadiene. So that's the first piece of the sigma framework. Then, um, then we also have five um, linear combinations of CC bonds. In other words, these look rather like the canonical orbitals on a fragment. One is entirely in phase bonding. Then we get one node in two different ways and two nodes in two different ways. And um, that's the sigma framework. Um, and, um, and so that's sort of the gentle warm up. The action then begins with what's happening with the pi electrons of each cyclopentadiene ligand. Um, so here they are. What we find is there are three pi type orbitals largely localized on the cyclopentadiene ligand. Um, and you can see this for yourself. This is why looking at these orbitals is in a way so interesting. These look rather like the, um, the normal um, pi type MOs of CP minus, but you can see them back donating quite strongly to the ion center. So you can see the little bit of admixture of D orbitals on the ion center, but there's no question that if you were to think about an ionic partition here, this is a dative bond and we've got CP minuses. And what about iron then? Well, um, ignoring the uh, core orbitals, we find three very beautifully localized um, iron D type orbitals that are occupied. So six iron D electrons, iron two, this is um, Oslo in action in a fairly simple or straightforward case. Um, okay, so, um, so that's our um, suite of tools, um, um, basically LOBA and Oslo. And, um, and now I'll try and spend uh, the, uh, the rest of my talk telling you about their application to some interesting and challenging cases. And um, again, if the cases lie at the borderline, um, one should bear in mind at the outset that no single method gives uh, a definitive answer. For me, there's no substitute for looking at the orbitals. I like the uh, lobar orbitals because after all, they're the natural localized orbitals of the complex. And I like the Oslo orbitals even better because they're the natural localized orbitals of the fragments. So they give you kind of two complementary perspectives. Let's see how this plays out in practice with some examples. So our first example is um, the complex between a, a copper ion of some oxidation state to be argued about with um, four CF3 ligands. And, um, and the debate is, is this copper three or is this copper one? And, um, and so this is uh, something that um, Marti and Pedro have examined using their own methods. And then um, in collaboration with me, we examined using LOBA. But before we look at LOBA, we should begin with IUPAC. The ionic view is that um, the copper carbon bonds, um, well, carbon is more electronegative than copper. So the division of, of charge from that formal Lewis structure um, goes entirely to CF3 minus, and this would then imply copper three and D8. Um, however, 
uh, there is another view, and this is um, this is called the inverted ligand field viewpoint. And um, normally, when we speak of non innocence in transition metal chemistry and transition metal complexes, we're thinking about um, the ligand being non innocent. That the, the a non innocent ligand can either accommodate or donate electrons away from its formal normal expected um, oxidation state. But in the inverted ligand field viewpoint. The metal has a kind of non-innocence that um, that copper three would be so such a high oxidation state that it will in fact grab two electrons away from the ligand field, such that the lumo of the complex instead of being um, instead of being centered on the metal could become ligand centered, and in this way we would make copper one with uh, d10. And this has been argued about in quite a range of papers. In a little webinar like this, I don't have time to go through the history, although we'll come back to the history um, a little bit at the very end of the talk. But what I what let me focus on now is what happens when we apply first Loba and then Oslo to this problem. So. Um, so for Loba, um, let's um, let's start off by looking at the um, at the copper carbon orbitals, um, and um, and here they are up the top right. The population on the carbon is 1.11. The population on the copper 0.7. The clarity index that this is ionic, and you know, here is the orbital to look at. So you can you can see that there is. Um, uh, that, that there is noticeable amplitude on both sites. Um, and so in this minus one oxidation state, um, you know, this is, um, this is, you know, not purely, not perfectly covalent, but it is certainly, um, um, but it is certainly polarized sufficiently strongly that within the parameters we've calibrated, we agree with the IUPAC view that, um, that these electrons need to be handed to um, to the ligands. Um, so we have formal CF3 minuses, and we have a, a clarity index of 100, suggesting that um, we should be pretty comfortable with this. I'm sure there can be exceptions where our clarity index won't be perfect, but, um, but this is at least a hint that it's pretty good. All right, well, um, then what if one um, goes to uh, reduce this? Um, so what if you add two electrons to the system? Well, um, uh, the reduction then, um, uh, you know, the, after the reduction, we can take another look at the copper carbon um, bond orbital. And what you see is um, that the ambiguity we had in the one minus case is strongly reduced in this three minus case. Look how much more polarized this is in the direction of CF3. So, um, CF3 minus um, is much clearer in the minus three oxidation state than it was in the minus one oxidation state. Um, you can also see that the structure of the complex has noticeably changed. And that, of course, is one of the arguments for the um, D10 assignment in this case is structure based. Um, but the double reduction occurs on the metal in our picture and takes it from um, copper three to copper one. And so that's the Loba picture of this. And, um, and now let's go and look at the Oslo picture. So in other words, the same problem done with the same density functional method, um, just with uh, different analysis. So instead of the localized bond orbitals of Loba, we'll now be looking at the fragment orbitals. And so here are the fragment orbitals on the copper atom in the plus one state. And um, and they're, they're just beautiful D-type orbitals, and um, and um, and I'm showing here the Foley values um, that are very very close to the perfectly localized limit of one that for this index where one is perfectly localized and two is exactly shared between two centers. These are really orbitals that live on uh, on copper, but there are only four of them, so that gives us eight. D electrons, and that suggests copper three, apart from the fact that we still need to go look at um, the uh, the um, the copper carbon bond. So what about that sigma bond? So then looking at looking at that sigma bond, which here becomes an orbital belonging to the ligand, there are four equivalent ones um, in the minus one oxidation um, minus one charge state of the complex, and if one takes a look at it, 
here you can you can really see that this this um this orbital shows the um the fact that there is um ligand metal interaction um that is constructive and that's why the this is uh why this complex can be prepared the foley value is about midway between the fully localized and the fully de delocalized limit. So we can certainly say that this is um, an edge case. In other words, it's um, it's not perfectly delocalized such that we would have to uh, covalently divide. Um, it, it's, it is still polarized towards the CF3. And uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's this story. It's it's this is a story that um, chemists as prominent as Roald Hoffman would not necessarily agree with. He supports the, um, the copper one oxidation state, and we'll come back to that right at the end of the talk. Okay, but for now, let's um, grab uh, another example. Um, so to summarize here, there is no support from either LOBA or Oslo for copper one, but it is clear from this covalent character looking at the populations in LOBA or looking at the Foley index, this fragment orbital localization index in um, Oslo, that this case is heading towards the borderline. Then if you twice reduce it, everything gets easy. Okay, so um, let's go on to um, an example where LOBA and Oslo are not quite equally successful. Um, so um, nickel dithiolate complexes. Um, and again, this is work that um, that Marti and Pedro did with me looking at LOBA. Um, so the accepted oxidation state assignments for, for nickel dithiolate um, are plus two for nickel, minus one for thiolate. And when we do the LOBA calculations, we find four pretty well localized d orbitals on nickel, which implies d8 and nickel two. Um, and um, and then to confirm nickel two, we then need to look at the dative bonds between the thiolate ligands. So these are these thiolate ligands um, are sulfur as donor atoms. And, um, and here are the LOBA orbitals um, describing the um, dative bond from sulfur to nickel. And um, uh, the nickel population is 0.6, the sulfur population 1.2. So in, um, in, in LOBA, this gives a clarity index of 100 for an ionic distribution of charge in favor of the sulfur. So in other words, the picture of this really is a, sulf a sulfur to nickel dative bond. Um, there's the second one looking broadly the same. Um, and, uh, and so that's all set. But what about the other orbitals on the ligand? And this is where, um, where the title of this slide, Some Trouble for LOBA, comes from. Um, so one ligand-centered orbital does not localize well. There it is. This is an unusual type orbital for a pipec mase localized bond orbital. It's not localized, um, but it's the best compromise that, um, that overall localization of all the occupied orbitals can achieve. It's also a little distressing to see that the right thiolate and the left thiolate are not symmetric as regards this orbital. This has noticeably more diffuse character for a given um, isosurface level, though the populations look exactly the same. Um, um, well, they look exactly the same between the two carbon atoms um, on, a, on a given thiolate. Um, so um, in order to get the accepted oxidation um, state for thiolates, um, we have to view this last not well localized electron pair as shared between the two ligands without any agency of the metal in between. And if we do that, we get the correct oxidation state. But it's probably fair to say that that was not an entirely satisfying um, procedure. So let's see how um, let's see how Oslo um, performs for this problem. And um, um, and let's see. I haven't animated this quite perfectly, so I'm just going to pull down here. So focusing on the top half of the slide, um, these are the four well localized d orbitals on nickel from the um, fragment localization procedure. And they're, they're beautiful looking D-type orbitals, nothing ambiguous here. The closest thing we have to delocalization is this particular D orbital, which does interact with the um, with the sulfur um, uh, with the sulfur centers to 
do a tiny bit of back donation for a 1.3 index of Foley, still far away from the delocalized limit. Because we now have separate localized orbitals for, um, um, for the, the thiolates, um, um, we can get some very nice, we get some very nice looking ones, um, plus plus combination on, on the two sulfurs of the left thiolate, plus minus combination of the sulfurs on the left thiolate. These are, um, well, the plus plus is um, quite strongly, um, quite strongly ionic. The plus minus is a little more spread out. Um, and then, um, and then we get something very interesting left over. We get, um, uh, we get one pi type ligand that localizes nicely. And then, um, and then we have one that splits perfectly between the two thiolate fragments. So, um, uh, so this one exhibits a, um, um, a delocalization index of precisely two. And that means that it is shared between uh, the two ligands. So in fact, this orbital came from the metal center. Um, the, remember that the uh, Oslo scheme is producing fragment orbitals from each of the three fragments. This delocalized one becomes the most localized last orbital to be added to the Oslo procedure. And, um, and we find it satisfying that its delocalization index is precisely two. So this, um, so this in some sense is a better resolution than Loba was able to achieve for this system. Um, okay, so that, that is just to um, remind you to focus on the bottom right there. Um, okay, so um, um, our next example is, um, is concerns um, metal complexes um, that include um, an NO ligand. An NO is a classic non-innocent ligand in the sense that it can be NO neutral, i.e. NO dot, it can be NO plus, or it can be NO minus. And from a, um, from a uh, kind of just a counting procedure like IUPAC, the best you can do is tell your counting procedure how to go based on structure. And so the IUPAC instructions say that in a linear geometry, NO is to be given the oxidation state plus one. In a bent geometry, it could be minus or neutral. Um, as I'll show you now, when we compare the minus two charge state of this um, pentacyano nitrocyl complex um, against the minus three charge state, both Oslo and Lobo correctly predict that NO is non-innocent, i.e. that the reduction from minus two to minus three occurs on the NO and takes it from NO plus to NO dot. Um, all right, so zeroing in on the minus two charge state, here are a few selected orbitals um, from LOBA, and um, and what do they look like? Well, um, this is um, this is an iron D-type orbital um, with population of 1.3 on the iron, 0.5 on the nitrogen of NO. So that is not a covalent interaction. This one is also roughly the same. Uh, this one's even more strongly in favor of the iron. And finally, here is one of the interactions with the, um, uh, with this, with this, with the cyanides, um, and this is uh, in favor of the cyanide. Um, so essentially, um, that, that is our, that's a selection of the orbitals on our way to concluding that we have NO plus for the, uh, for the nitrocyl ligand in the minus two charge state. If we now switch from the minus two charge state to the minus three charge state, well, before you stare at the beautiful orbitals, first take note that NO has gone from linear to bent. That's the, um, that's the key, the thing that IUPAC can key in on. And then we see that, um, um, that we've got um, an orbital that now appears, um, and, and these, by the way, are the alpha spin orbitals. Um, we've now got um, an orbital that appears on the nitrogen um, that is new, and um, and this is uh, this is the extra electron going on to NO to turn it from NO plus to NO dot, and the other orbitals here are well remain ion centered, ion centered, and then here's an extract from the cyano, the interactions with the cyano group. Um, okay, so um, 
so that's the that's the Luba outcome. Um, I'm not going to show you the Oslo ones, but they are the, they come out the same. Um, and uh, and now let me um, let me talk about one more class of systems that gives trouble for Luba. I'm not going to show you the orbitals for this because we we've done quite a lot of them and there'll be too many to look at. But let me just say a, a few general generalities about carbenes. We've got kind of two general classes, well, actually three, but um, the Fischer type carbenes are accepted as having an oxidation state of the carbene that is zero. And the Schrupp type carbenes um, give you an accepted oxidation state for the carbene of minus two. This is a class of system where LOBA does not do very well because in fact, the, um, the, the localized bonding orbitals that, um, that correspond to the carbene metal center interaction don't localize very well, and so it becomes difficult to make an assignment, um, ionic versus covalent, in favor of the either the metal or the carbene. Um, Oslo, by contrast, works very well. So this is a um, this is a slide, um, some data from our um, from our just about ready to submit paper, showing you that for all of the for four Fischer type carbenes that we looked at, the predicted um, carbene oxidation state is correctly zero um, for those complexes. The, um, the, the last Foley value, remember this is one for perfectly localized on the carbene or the metal and two for perfectly delocalized, shows that you are really heading towards um, the delocalized limit here. And it's not that much different for the Schrock type ones. The Prediction is correct, but the last Foley value shows that this is um, on its way to um, uh, to being at the edge of um, at the edge of covalent. Okay, so um, I'm going to wrap up and try and leave a bit of time for questions and not take too much of your time. But I hope I have tried to persuade you. I hope I've shown you first enough about the algorithms. Secondly, enough about the applications to try and persuade you that both the LOBA and the Oslo tools in QCAM can help show you what the electrons are doing in organometallic complexes. LOBA is an older method, um, but it's still a good one. And, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's available in QCAM along as part of our localized orbital package. The new clarity index helps to indicate when assignments become borderline. And, um, and I've shown you not just successes, but some of these you know, borderline type cases, the transition metal carbenes, the, the diethylates. Um, and this is typically a defect of the localized orbitals. In other words, when you're trying to maximize the, the overall localization of all the occupied orbitals, yet, yet focus attention just on a couple at the very end, this can be um, a defect of the, or a limitation of the LOBA procedure. It's still quite worthwhile. Um, the brand new Oslo procedure uses different localized orbitals that are fragment specific and an accompanying localization fragment localization index that tracks the fragment populations. And using those two bits of input, we've designed a quite effective iterative algorithm. And I've also tried to, I, I hope, show you through examples that looking at the fragment localized orbitals themselves is quite advantageous. They're, they come out very, very nice and quite insightful. In other words, compared to anything aggregated like a population, um, really looking orbital by orbital is the way to get insight. Um, and in fact, I do think that, um, that looking at these tricky borderline or limiting cases by more than one approach is really ideal because you get to sort of see different perspectives on exactly the same electronic structure. In other words, to see what the electrons are doing from more than just one perspective is really, I think, useful. And um, to wrap up, I promised you I would come back to this copper CF34 minus system and, um, um, and our, um, our wonderful um, Nobel Prize winning colleague, Roald Hoffman, uh, wrote the following statement that, uh, that I'll, I'll read to you here um, about what the electrons are doing in, uh, in these borderline cases. He said, our clever colleagues are certain to come up with foolproof experimental or theoretical measures of oxidation state, which they will say will banish our vacillations about the oxidation state to the dustbin of history. Why do we have the feeling that chemists will stay with the productive ambiguity we explore? And, um, and so he's thinking here 
at least in large part, about the inverted ligand field, its reality or its unreality. You can think back to the orbitals I showed you to get the LOBA perspective or the Oslo perspective on this issue. But, um, but I do recommend strongly that if you find this interesting and you want and you haven't already read this chemical reviews article, it's a good one to read. Hoffman writes brilliantly. Um, he goes on to say, the experimental work of Lancaster et al. establishes for this complex quite complete occupation of all five 3D orbitals. Well, you might want to think back to the orbital pictures that I showed you before and ask, is that supported by high quality density functional theory? The answer seems to be apparently not. He, he then goes on, with full cognizance of the ambiguity inherent in any definition of oxidation state, two of the authors of the above chemical reviews paper prefer to think of the monoanion as having copper in oxidation state one, two other authors prefer to see the copper as copper three, and let us call the remaining authors neutral. So yeah, so, so when one is trying to understand either chemical bonding or chemical reactivity and redox processes, and you're at the borderline, there really is room to disagree, but there's no substitute for looking at the orbitals to have some real electronic structure data upon which you can base your discussions. That would be the only thing I would add to this. Um, so let me um, pause here and stop and thank my co-workers. So in particular, I would like to again thank Abdul Rahman al um, a wonderful graduate student in my group who's done all of the Oslo implementation in QCAM and lots and lots of other things besides. And I would like to thank Marty Gimfra, who was a, uh, a wonderful visitor and a very productive collaborator together with his dynamic advisor, Pedro Salvador. They're both in Girona, but we were, we were very happy to have Marty at Berkeley for a little bit. And then I do also owe thanks to Jeroen van der Meinsbrugger, who did, uh, who cooperated with Marty in the first LOBA study and his co-supervisor, Alex Bell. And early LOBA, vintage LOBA almost, um, Alex Tom, who's now a very successful independent theorist at Cambridge University back in the days when he was a postdoc with me, and Eric Sundstrom, who's a wonderful graduate student. Funding from the uh, National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy, and of course the software um, is the focus of this, and um, Abdul's um, Oslo implementation, I believe, is now runnable in the latest version of QCAM. And QCAM, of course, is also the, the back end or the engine of Spartan 20. Thank you again for listening, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Martin, for the wonderful talk. Uh, we will now open to questions. You can add them into the chat, and I will go through them. If you're watching this as a recorded message, there is a talk forum that I will post the link. I will show the link here at the, in a second uh, in the final uh, title screen, but you can ask questions there to Martin as well. So we do have a couple questions so far. So the first question, uh, thank you for this brilliant insight. How well does LOBA and or Oslo work for systems that show valence uh, tautomerization, like the CO catacol system? That's a good question. I, I, I'm sort of hesitant to make any strong statement in the absence of any personal experience. Um, but, uh, but I feel that, um, um, that sort of a, um, anything that has mixed valent character um, is very interesting to look at in terms of the of the of, of loba and or oslo and um and try and see how uh the mixed valent character plays out in terms of the orbital so i don't know offhand but um but again that's partly why we we make these tools is hopefully other people will go and look at even more interesting systems than the ones we've been able to stare at all right. The next question is, is Oslo available in QCHEM 5.4 only? Um, it will be available in QCHEM 5.4 and all later versions, um, so not just 5.4. Um, and, um, and of course, this is a method that can be implemented in other packages as well. But um, you know, QCHEM is an open teamware cooperation. We try and uh, invite people who find our ideas and our methods useful. We try and invite you to help sustain this effort of, of a couple of hundred developers by buying a copy or at least trying a copy. So I hope you will. Uh, the next question is, do all carbene transition metal complexes present a problem for OS assignment? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, again, it's 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 ones it's ones where um, there is this kind of borderline character where there is covalency in the metal-carbene interaction. 
Um, that is often a feature of carbenes, but I'm, I don't know that it is always a feature. Essentially, you know, another way of saying it, I suppose, is that um, the oxidation state concept is perfectly clear for perfectly ionic species. Um, it remains valid and relevant for systems that may exhibit features like partial covalency or partial ligand non-innocence or partial mixed valent character. And then eventually, um, eventually, you know, one one needs to let the orbitals speak for themselves and um, and not apply a rigid definition. Um, okay. And then uh, the next question is, uh, I don't seem to be able to see the information about Oslo on the QCAM manual. Uh, when would the web page be updated to reflect Oslo information? Hmm. I guess we have to consult our web czar about that. Do Do you have any thoughts? On that yourself, Peter? Uh, I know they are working to update it. I know they're trying to get that together uh, soon, uh, like this week. So I'm not sure. Uh, I think I think the manual is going to be updated this week. I'm not going to. I'm not part of the web page team, but very soon. I guess I might just add that I have a similar issue with the manuscript, which has been languishing uh, in my uh, um, on, on my uh, on my to-do list, and I'm hoping to get that um, you know, finished also roughly a week from now. Um, so um, so we'll we'll post that to archive and submit it, and you know it needs to undergo peer review and all that kind of stuff. But we're we're pretty ex we we're pretty happy with the resulting method, and at least in the not only the test cases that I showed you today, but other test cases that I didn't show you, it appears to work generally very well um, in the sense that we recover accepted chemical intuition and um, in cases where that's clear enough and then seem to get useful insight in the more borderline cases. All right, um, I just got a message that the manual is just about ready to post this week or next week. So that's <laughs> when Oslo uh, will be within there. Um, we do have another question that has trickled in. Uh, could LOBA, and Oslo be used with CAS SCF? Um, in, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the answer is not without some additional modifications. In other words, some um, LOBA and Oslo are both built on the idea that a system has a definite number of orbitals that are occupied rather than some number that are fractionally occupied. Um, so I think it's actually an interesting problem that uh, that we we certainly have not yet addressed as to how to make tools like this available for multi-configurational wave functions such as CAS SCF. For a long time, QCAM didn't have CAS SCF, but we finally broke down and added it uh, a, year, a year or two ago. And QCAM also now has um, the ASCII SCF method, which allows the use of very, very large active spaces, up to 50 electrons in 50 orbitals or so. So if your interest runs to CAS SCF, we can certainly do some interesting calculations, but I'm not sure we can analyze them with these kinds of tools yet. All right, is there any other additional questions? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Let me all right. Uh, thank you very much, for every Martin, for the wonderful talk, and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, this will be recorded. This has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page, which is linked down below. Uh, we will also have a talk forum post on talk.qchem.com that you can ask additional questions to Martin or the QChem team or other uh, QChem users. Thank you all for attending, and that will end our session today. This concludes our webinar. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation and see you at the next webinar.